One morning in July, I was driving into the sun, and man, I wish I could selectively block the sun. Oh wait, there's a technology that does that. The shadow that it casts onto your face looks like a superhero mask. It's like projecting a pair of sunglasses onto your face. Welcome to Beyond Bosch. I'm Jessica Dahl. Today we have Jason Zink and Ryan Todd talking about a project that they're working on called Virtual Visor. Jason and Ryan, I want to take a minute to have you introduce yourselves, who you are, what you do at Bosch, and, and then I'd love to just dive into this topic. So Ryan, would, why don't you go first? Uh, hi, my name is Ryan Todd. Um, I've been with Bosch for five and a half years now. I do project management for uh, gasoline engine control software. The virtual visor project started in that powertrain controls group and so yeah I feel like that's a good transition sure my name is jason zink i've been with bosch for about 15 years now i also came out of the powertrain controls group uh, but i recently this year moved to our car multimedia group and that was actually to move over and continue working on the virtual visor project so did you guys know each other or work together before this project yes we did yep. so, so we we sat in the same room we were in the same department and uh, yeah, we were we were friends long before the virtual visor came along. So, what is virtual visor? So maybe I'll I'll start with that, Ryan. You can you can add in. Sure. So the virtual visor actually addresses a problem that we we all have to deal with at one point or another. So when the sun is shining in your face, um, of course it's a distraction and it's uncomfortable. So your your usual solution to that is you flip down your sun visor. The problem with that is when you flip down the sun visor, it solves the sun glare problem by introducing another one. It blocks a lot of your view. So by by blocking the sun, regardless of whether the sun's on the right side of the visor or the left side of the visor, you always get a full sun visor worth of blocking. Um, so that, that leads to situations where you don't have as good a visibility as you probably want. When you're driving, because of this visibility uh, decrease, when you turn left or turn right, um, a lot of times you'll flip the visor up out of the way when you turn away from the sun, and then as soon as you turn back towards the sun, you flip it back down. And every time you take your hand off of the um, off of the steering wheel to move the visor, um, it's a it's a distraction and it, it leads to a lack of focus on the driving instead of um, instead of just doing what you're supposed to when you're in the driver's seat. The virtual visor, uh, it actually solves this problem by selectively blocking only the part of the, the visor where the sun would be hitting your eyes, leaving the rest of it totally transparent. So it does that uh, with a liquid crystal display, uh, replacing the traditional visor so that we can, at any point on the visor, choose whether it should be transparent or opaque. Wow. So I'm trying to visualize that. So it's a liquid crystal display. It goes just where your eyes are. Does it look almost like raccoon eyes on your face? Uh, one of the things that we've uh, commented on when we uh, look at pictures of ourselves as we test out the visor prototypes is that uh, the shape of the shadow that it casts onto your face being just around your two eyes looks very much like you're trying to wear some sort of superhero mask or something like that. <laughs> it's Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, kind of like yeah, vir virtual sunglasses. Cool. Yeah. It's like projecting a pair of sunglasses onto your face. Okay. So speaking of glasses, how does it work? Um, can it tell if you have glasses or sunglasses on? I wear glasses in my everyday life, and I've not noticed any drop in accuracy. It tracks me just fine. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So the system actually uses a, a driver-facing camera and it looks for the shadows on your face. So as long as it can see through your glasses, then it can certainly track the shadows. Wow, that's amazing. How did this idea come about? <laughs> that one's for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple years ago, every morning, I drove half hour in east straight into the sunrise. Every evening, I drove half hour west straight into the sunset. And... Uh, I would try to adjust my schedule to try to avoid the worst of the glare problem, but it never really seemed to work out that way. So uh, here's where it gets interesting, because 
innovations often come from the strangest places. In this case, it came from thinking about what kind of television set I wanted to purchase for my living room. Um, specifically, I had just realized that uh, like new OLED televisions actually have more in common with uh, legacy technologies like CRT and plasma than they do with their main competitor, LCD. Um, and that's because most display technologies are designed to answer the question, how do I convert electricity into visible light? Which makes sense. You're trying to show a picture to the person. Liquid crystal displays do the exact opposite. They need a backlight because the LCD module itself doesn't give off light. It blocks light. So the whole purpose of an LCD is to selectively block the light that you don't want to see. And one morning in July, I was driving into the sun on my way to my weekly innovation meeting with Jason, and the two thoughts came together of, man, I wish I could selectively block the sun. And, oh, wait, there's a technology that does that. Wow. There you have it. <laughs> I just instantly pictured the sun, obviously, acting as that light that you're describing behind the LCD. That's amazing. So you kind of had this aha moment, and it's convenient that you're walking into an innovation meeting. Were you able to just walk in and share this? Uh, yeah, the general, uh, the general structure of our uh, innovation meetings was we'd show up, we'd talk about whether if we had any specific ideas that were new that hadn't yet been discussed. Uh, otherwise, we'd visit whatever we were previously working on before. I think we were doing augmented reality applications at the time. So uh, cameras facing towards things and computer vision understanding what you're looking at was one of the things we were already working on. So that was another piece of the puzzle that came together. Yeah, when, when Ryan brought the idea to us and, and started describing it, at first we totally didn't understand. So he had to, he had to tell us a couple of times. But after after the initial like concept got through, then you know there was there was three of us that we we all saw it as really kind of a compelling situation, and we we just started running with it from there. You know, it's it's so interesting, and I've heard you talk about this in kind of talking about the project itself. How you know so many other things in the vehicle have been updated throughout the years, and you've got something like the visor that has stayed the same, right? for quite a while. Yeah, I believe the first sun visor on a motor vehicle was like 1927 or something. So it's been almost a century. Yep. Wow. Almost, almost 100 years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably time. About time someone made of it better version. Okay. So with, well, with that, you have a bit of AI here at play. And I feel like that's really interesting because a lot of people don't necessarily know what AI is. And what I mean by AI is artificial intelligence. Could you talk a little bit more about what that means to you? Yeah, so in, in the virtual visor, AI is actually an enabling technology for us. So we we mentioned that we have the visor that is, you know, that's that's kind of our actuator. Then we have the camera, which is watching the, the driver. And AI is used to determine not only where the driver is in the in the video stream, but then also to determine where the landmarks are on their face. So if you think about uh, at the corners of your eyes or your nose or your mouth, um, AI is is actually how we we get those the location of each of those points, and that allows us to then analyze the light that's hitting you know all the different parts of the face. Uh, it, all of that is used as an input into our main algorithm, which can then decide which parts of the visor to to darken and which ones to make transparent. Um, and so, without without AI, we wouldn't be able to implement the the core algorithm of virtual visor. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So, when you talk about being able to read defining features of your face, do you have to know? You know, like 
do you have to get scanned or have your picture taken? Let's say I got into someone else's car and it didn't already know my face. Does it have the capability to recognize different types of facial structures? Yep. So the that's actually one of the big benefits of, of artificial intelligence is that you can train it on a wide variety of data. It's actually required that you train it on a lot of uh, data. And that's that's one of the reasons that you have to make sure that your training data is, is a diverse, um, you know, set of examples of, of the things that you're trying to do with the AI. So in the case of face detection, um, the, the algorithm is trained with a lot of different faces from different uh, lighting conditions, different uh, you know skin tones, different size and shape uh, people. And once the algorithm is sufficiently trained, it can generalize to you know the general concept of what a face is. So it looks for two eyes and the, the you know the outline of a face and it looks for a mouth. So uh, the, the algorithm really kind of uh, uses the data to define the routine that it uses to, to accomplish its goal. So it, it, in that case, it works for a wide variety of people. And um, that's, yeah, that's, that's the, the main reason that AI is such a benefit for us. That's so exciting. So what's next? Is this something that is going to be available in the near future? What's the timeline? Where are you guys at in this process? So we're we're actually um, going to be unveiling the product at CES. Um, that's that's the the first public appearance of it. So that'll be really a big big step for us. Um, we're we're in discussions with some of our OEM partners, both for commercial vehicles and for passenger vehicles. And uh, yeah, we're really excited about the momentum that we have going forward. That is really exciting. You know, as I'm thinking about it, getting closer to reality for me personally. So kind of just stepping back again to talking about detecting our faces and data privacy being such a hot topic and a very important topic to all of us. What happens to that data that detects my face when I do get in the vehicle? Right now, the whole system is completely self-contained. No personally identifiable information is saved once you turn off the device. Nothing is transmitted outside of the device. the uh, basic implementation for an everyday customer, I imagine, would probably be pretty similar. That the easiest way to ensure that uh, information doesn't go somewhere where you don't want it to is to make it impossible for it to go somewhere where you don't want it to. Okay, so for me, that is a major concern, obviously. It's also so exciting that we are having these types of discussions that can lead to new innovations in the vehicle. I love the fact that you had this idea. It's a common problem. I can instantly relate to it. I'm sure those listening can relate to that glare in your face. For those of you maybe listening during your commute, you may be even dealing with that right now. You can't see anything and the visor is barely helping you out. How do you guys feel about being able to have this concept, an idea, walk into a meeting and it's now becoming a reality? Yes, it's the really awesome i mean it's it's great that we've we've had the opportunity to be able to work on the project oh yeah it's you know it's it's out there uh, we actually won a ces award um so we're we're starting to get some external recognition as well and i've, I've told ryan several times before that this this project actually is one of the best learning activities that i've i've ever done so ryan ryan mentioned we came out of powertrain. Um, we didn't have any any background in computer vision or, or working with uh, LCDs or anything like that. And so from a technical standpoint, there's really lots to learn. Um, but also even just project management, you know, there's, there's so many aspects of creating a product that I was never exposed to before. So it was, it's really, really been a great experience. Even some of the details of the process of how we got here have been very cool that like it was a startup type environment. We went through Shark Tank type pitches. We got rounds of seed funding. It was so many opportunities for learning and growth and gathering skills that we can use moving forward. It's a good stepping stone to take the project to the next level. Mm -hmm. Honestly, that is super inspiring to me and I hope to to others too, because I feel like many of us get ideas and think, oh, that's probably already been created, or there's all these reasons why it wouldn't work. You know, the fact that you guys brought this to the table, and Ryan, of course, you walked in with this idea, and you guys have come so far with it. 
that's just really inspiring to me. And I love it. I, I think that's such a great thing and such a great experience for all of you and something we can all learn from. Thank you. Yeah. So with that, kind of talking about stepping stones and growth and career paths, and we don't know where those are going to lead. I wanted to ask the best piece of advice that you've gotten. It could be career or personal, something that may be the first thing that comes to mind that's stuck with you. Uh, the automatic answer for me is something that Jason has said many times through this process is uh, don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough. That at many stages in this process, uh, I have been uh, fixated on making sure that XYZ is as best as it possibly can be. But turns out, even if there's a glitch, even if you have to revert to a previous prototype for a demonstration, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so many things that you may be afraid of causing complete failure, they they don't. It's going to be fine. Yeah, things have a way of working themselves out. Mm-hmm. For me, I would say um, it, it would come from our CFO, Max Straub. So during during some of our, our pitches, we actually get to interact with the, the top management in uh, Bosch in North America. And she she always encouraged you to say yes to whatever whatever is ahead of you and then get worried about how you're going to do it later. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's that served us well because in a lot of these instances, if you if you're not familiar with whatever the challenge is ahead of you, you really just have to, you know, bite the bullet and, and jump in and start working on it. Um, you you learn the fastest that way, and you, know, you you don't miss a lot of opportunities that way either. Oh, that's really good. Both of those are really good, and I think sometimes harder to walk out than it sounds. So you guys sharing about how AI is an enabling technology for this amazing idea that you've come up with. Do you have any recommendations for people that maybe want to learn more about AI and you know just the future of AI and technology in general, either websites or books or things that have helped you gain more understanding? So for me, um, I would say one of the one of the easiest ways and it's very inexpensive way to get into it is um, I, I actually started out using Coursera courses. So some of the, the early pioneers of, um, of artificial intelligence, including Andrew Eng and Sebastian Thrun, they both have courses that are available uh, either at very low cost or no cost. Um, and so I, I started with the Andrew N courses on Coursera. Um, those, you know, they're they're very uh, I would say bite-sized pieces of information that you can go with. It's a little bit technical, but if you're if you're on the technical side, that's a, a good way to get started. And uh, recently, Andrew Eng also published AI for Everybody. I think that may be the name of it, AI for Everybody. And that gives a very, I would say, management-focused view of artificial intelligence and kind of what what the terminology is and how you can interact with AI in your company and how how kind of to adopt it. So both of those, I think, would be good ways to go. Uh, There's also, within within AI, on uh, the implementation side, um, there's so many open source tools. It seems like everything is kind of based on open source. So it's, it's, I would say it's never been easier to get involved and start using it than, than it is now. Hmm. Okay, this is great. I'll be sure to put that information in the show notes. But what about you, Ryan? Do you have anything else to add to that? Um, you pretty much captured it, yeah. <laughs> well, you guys, this has been so good and such an exciting episode to have you both on here as innovators and people taking a chance on an idea and really overcoming so many obstacles. And it's really inspiring. I'm excited. I'm excited to see the virtual visor and experience it for myself. And just thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Maybe we'll come back once the thing's in production. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Perfect. Maybe we'll record while I'm in a vehicle with the virtual visor in action. Yeah, sounds good. fun. If you enjoyed this episode, you definitely want to take a listen to our next one, talking about something as small as a pinky nail that is having a huge impact.